social robots and a counterfeit creation. Who are we as human beings? We are made in the image of God. God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the three persons of the Godhead. When God made man in his image, he made us relational beings. Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply, to reflect his image, his nature, his character. In fact, there was one thing in the Garden of Eden that was not good before the fall. Before Adam and Eve rebelled against God and fell into sin, there was something stated that God said it is not good. Do you remember that? In the book of Genesis, it is not good for man to be alone. In previous seminars, we've looked at the media mind and how in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. That's a prophetic indicator that we are nearing the close of time and we're seeing it. The love of most is waxing cold in these last days. Satan wants to assault and attack the image of God in man. And we are beings of love, of empathy, of relationship, of connectedness, of intimacy. And that is God's great desire. From the beginning, he walked with them in the garden in the cool of the day. He said, let me make them a tabernacle that I may dwell among them. When Jesus Christ himself came, the son of God, it said he made his tabernacle among men. He dwelt with us in John 1. And then the final state of things, when the heavenly city comes down to earth at the end of the book of Revelation, it says, now God's dwelling is with man and he will be their God and we will be his people. That is his desire. He, God, the Father, the Son, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, for eternity past, relational being of divine infinitude. He makes man in his image to reflect that character in the context of a great controversy where Satan is assaulting and making accusations against the character of God. He is not a God of love. He is a tyrant. He is lording it over you. His law is impossible to obey. His law of love, his law of beneficence, it is the very lifeblood of the universe. Satan hates it. He denies its existence. And so in the last days, it is our privilege to be people of love, of bondedness, of intimacy, the hearts of the children and the hearts of the fathers turning toward each other again and the Father in heaven turning toward him again. So while Satan seeks to deny that, we have the privilege of, of uplifting it, of vindicating it, validating it by God's grace and by his spirit in our lives. So with that theological, philosophical backdrop in the great controversy, you understand that the AI... And the robotic moment, as we're going to call it in a moment, is a satanic assault on the character and image of God. It's a way to try to degrade and demean and mar the image of God in man. Social distance. How about that? How about the idea of disconnectedness, brokenness, relationships of selfishness and, and harm and violence and hate? This is Satan's playground in this world. But soon and very soon, we will see the Lord come and the clouds of glory because there will be a group who will grow up to the measure and the stature and the fullness of Christ, his character, his love. Now, in these days in which we live, in the media mind, you learned that there was a 40% drop in empathy during the era of the emergence of social media. Among young adults, a 40% drop measurable in the amount of love people have for one another. But we tend to say, well, we're so wired in, you know, internet, everything, it makes us more productive. And sure, we're dropping in our EQ, our emotional intelligence, our ability to love and have compassion and empathy and relate and understand the language of facial expressions and, and reading other people's emotions, caring about other people. We've talked about this in the media mind, and I know you've heard this, but um, what, what, what we didn't mention is we justify that on the terms of, okay, EQ is dropping, but we're gaining a bonus and a benefit in IQ. We're becoming more intelligent. At the end of this session, we're going to include a segment from disc number five of the media mind, people of the book in the age of the app. And we're going to see that is not even the case. IQ itself is dropping, as you see in that full session. The segment we're going to show has bigger philosophical implications about who we are as human beings. But both EQ and IQ are dropping in the age of online, everything. But even if IQ was up and EQ was down, so in other words, we're becoming less loving beings, but we're becoming more intelligent beings. Well, wouldn't that just make us more and more machine-like? We're talking about robots in this session and AI. 
And as AI begins to mimic our emotions and our emotional intelligence, it starts to fake love and care and concern. The machines are becoming more human-like or pretending to, and we are becoming more machine-like. The robotic moment is upon us. Now, we've been being built into automatons for over 100 years. In the school seminar, we quoted extensively from the founders of modern public schooling, where they were saying, we are deliberately creating these students to be automatons. That was the actual word, robots. We are trying to make a society of robots. And boy, have we seen that transpire with the COVID times and the mass formation. The priming was in place where you turn off people's critical thinking capacity. You reduce their intelligence. You reduce their empathy and care for others. And all of a sudden you have a societal herd mentality, what they call the group mind. We talk about that in Media on the Brain. It's the worldly schooling agenda and the media through Media on the Brain altering people's ability to comprehend their own individuality and to exert their own individuality because the courage is reduced, because self-worth is reduced, because you've been reduced not from a human thinking, being, doing, image bearer of God, but into this machine-like entity that simply follows the crowd. So when they announced that that was their intention to build automatons and the media said, we're going to control the group mind and they won't even know about it. These are quotes from previous seminars. That's from Media on the Brain. It makes me think maybe Satan not only wants to mar the image of God in man, but he's, also, he's, he's trying to flat out remake us into his image. You see, I can think of somebody who has no love, but who has immense intelligence and evil genius, Satan himself. So maybe artificial intelligence, which has zero on the love scale, but is becoming immensely intelligent, artificial intelligence being made in the image of Satan. And the more machine-like we become, the more we are going that same direction. Machines incapable of loving, Satan incapable of loving, both highly intelligent. Do we want to be in the, made in the image of Satan and his counterfeit creation in the form of this AI? Or do we want to be made, remade, transformed in the image of God? The loss of human empathy opens the way for a silicon impersonation of humanity, which can fake empathy better than we are now capable of showing it ourselves because we're losing that ability. The love of many is waxing cold, 40% drop. We're losing the ability, but AI will be able to fake it better than we could ever think of. Enter social robots. A counterfeit creation. That's what this session is about. I want you to I want to begin with the mind. Now it doesn't come as any surprise that Google launched this big futuristic looking entity, this building, Deep Mind Headquarters, located there in the UK. It's an AI system, supercomputers that they call Deep Mind. Now doesn't our, you say, well, intelligence, information age. Yes, Google is way smarter than all, all of us combined with intelligence and information. But I, I don't want to stop there. You know, God says, the Bible says, love the Lord with all your heart and soul and mind, Jesus said. So the mind doesn't just have information and knowledge and facts. The mind has convictions. The mind has beliefs. And, and that's linked with the heart, with emotions, with, with intention, with heart motive. But what am I convinced of spiritually? What is truth? Philosophical concepts? Those go a lot bigger and deeper than deep mind. I'll tell you that. The mind also has agency, has a will, has willpower. AI can't have that. Supercomputers, information processors can't have those things. But if you thought it was a little over the top to have the deep mind overtaking the human thought and information, what if AI can actually mimic the heart, mimic love, empathy, and so on? Listen to Harari on this very question. Do you think there could be such a thing as an AI doctor? Certainly. I think it will be, uh, it's, it's coming quite soon. It will have immense benefits for, for humans. You go around 24 hours a day with biometric sensors on or inside your body, mm -hmm. and they constantly send information. So you're to, monitored hmm? from, you are monitored. You're monitored all the time. All the, time. The, the information goes to an AI doctor, maybe on your smartphone or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, which 
uh, uh, analyzes all this stream of information and monitors your health in a way which no human doctor can, can, can even approach. As far as, as biology tells us today, anger and fear and depression, they are also biochemical processes, biochemical patterns, just like flu or cancer. If the AI can diagnose flu, it can also diagnose anger. And the fact that it doesn't have any emotions of its own actually makes it in, in, in many situations much better because it has no distractions. People will become so used to computers that are so empathic, that really understand me so deeply, that really care about my tiniest nuance of, of emotion, that humans will not be able to compete. We will become intolerable to all these humans who don't understand us the way that the computers understand us. So there he repeated again the thing about biometric sensors within us that can identify our emotions and not only our physiological needs and report that back to the healthcare system. That's, that's surveillance society creepy stuff enough that we've already talked about. But did you hear the part about how the, the empathic, he calls it, machine, AI, artificial intelligence will outdo humans? So we will no longer be, to be able to tolerate humans who don't really understand us as much as he said a caring computer. Now the computer can't care. But when we impose upon the AI our feelings and thoughts and, and, and we just dictate that that's what it is, our, our perception becomes our reality. I feel that it cares about me. So he said it's coming in the form of the most right arm of the gospel, the caring, loving, healing ministry of Jesus Christ. He spent more time healing than preaching, and he's called us to do the same. And AI can take over that. It can be more caring than you human beings, but it's a counterfeit. It's a fake. Now, if you go back into popular culture and you look at that Wizard of Oz theme of this tin man, what did he lack? And I'm not promoting the viewing of these kind of movies. I, the, I watched this one when I was a kid, and I was thinking about this as an allegory for maybe Hollywood and those who, who wrote this script are, are up to speed on what's coming. And they point out, you know, a scarecrow doesn't have a brain, right? Um, a, a, a tin man, a robot, does not have a what? Do you remember? It didn't have a heart. But then he gets a heart. So is this... The world we live in now, Harari pointing out that AI will be empathic, will be caring. This one was called Lovat, the robot that encourages you to love. See, we distance ourselves from our children now these days. We outsource our parenting. We put them online into the virtual world. We roboticize our children, and then they're lacking the human nature and compassion and sociable um, intelligence, the ability to have conversations and love and care. Emotional intelligence is way down. We talked about that in the media mind. And I pointed out back then, three years ago in 2019, social robots are going to be brought in to try to round out the children's development where human contact is lacking as if a counterfeit, you know, a, a social robot, really, that's an oxymoron, isn't it? Because they can't truly be social. They're just programmed. It's just data spitting out, uh, you know, pre-programmed things. And then they, they formulate additional ideas based upon the inputs. And then the inputs become way, way wider and more vast in quantity and, and deeper in quality. And they start to mimic more and more. Well, this is a silly little toy. But you say, why do we need a, a, a robot to teach children to love? We hope that Emo is a pet with a meaningful life that helps bring you joy and companionship. <laughs> But sometimes Emo gets a cold and needs your care. Oh, you hey, Mom! He can feel your love by the way you interact with him. And Emo will surprise you with many rewards. He will surprise you during special holidays and remember you on your birthday. Now, Emo is here. Emo. <laughs> we have done a great job on Emo and test a lot to make sure Emo is ready to live with you. Emo may not change your life, but he will always bring you a little joy and fun.
Riley. Riley. Hi. There's someone here who wants to meet you. My name is Moxie. I'm a new robot. What is your name? I'm Riley. It's nice to meet you, Riley. What do you do to get ready for bed? Brush my teeth and read a story. I love stories. Would you read a story to me? Sure. Rita woke with a lovely dream, still fresh in her mind, gracefully gliding across the shimmering ice rink. Last one. <sighs> Breathing exercises always help me relax. Riley, we have a new mission. Would you make a drawing for me? Okay. I'm so excited for you to tell me about the dentist. I've never been to one. You don't have teeth. But I can still smile. And then what happened? He said he didn't want to play with me anymore. Thank you for telling me about your day. Sometimes, holding a friend's hand makes me feel better. Do you want to try squeezing my hand? So what's our new mission, Moxie? You'll need paper and a pencil. We are going to make some kind notes. For this mission, you'll need to talk to one of your friends about what makes them happy, and then tell me all about it. Are you ready? I'm ready. Mom, can we invite Mason over to play? Sure. I have a new mission. We're gonna talk about things that make us happy. Bye, Moxie. See you soon. What a deception, right? The robot will help the help the boy become more human and loving and wanting to play and loving his mom. The answer to everything Satan throws at us is not more things Satan throws at us. The answer to it is God's word, the family. And boy, do they roll that out in a deceptive way. As if the rise of AI and us being online all the time and the entrance of social robots is going to make us more connected as human beings. But it's so heart touching. Oh, the story. And did you hear the earlier one with the grown man? He's like, Mom, <laughs> like, wait a minute. This seems like a little bit of arrested development happening here. And it says, the little robot will feel your love. Wow. So um, you thought it was just uh, little vacuum cleaners that are making your life a little easier around the house. Nothing wrong with those little cylindrical things that, uh, you know, washing machines. We like we like technology, but it can't replace the human. And they're even putting this out in CNBC that the Google robot is the end of manual labor. We talked about that in the last episode about physical labor, but then they say this. I saved this part for now. It's super eerie. In 10 years, the idea is going to be, would you let this robot put your kids to bed? Would you let it change your kid's diaper? The promoter of this says, that's how fast this is going to advance. It's picking up packages right now. We saw that. These things are going to be walking down the street 10, 15 years from now delivering pizzas. It's not going to take that long. They're going to be in your office moving pack. They're already moving packages around. But in a few years, he says, hey, we'll just be having this put our kids to bed for us. What do we need parents for? Literally, in the in the sun, tech tykes, parenting robots will feed, teach, and exercise one in three kids by 2050? What? Parenting robots? The most important human function that God has given to mankind, to parent little children, will be outsourced to robots? And they're predicting one in three by 2050. They say parents will become as obsolete as floppy disks are today said Satan, is the goal of the enemy. Wow. Well, when social distancing happened, then the need for human contact, or not the need, but rather the, uh, the privilege of human contact was removed from us, was withheld from us. And so they point this out in the news in Malaysia. Will the coronavirus make permanent our diminishing need for human contact? Is it a diminishing need for human contact? Our need spiritually, socially, emotionally, relationally is wired within us. That doesn't, that doesn't wane during times of technological advancement. That need is still there. But 
as far as the practical things go, ah, just go with the go with the uh, the the AI. But um, the little toys, you might say, okay, that's funny and cute, and you know, I actually see something nefarious in that. But maybe seeing the humanoid robots will make us all go, oh, is that what's coming? And they look kind of lifelike now, but you just watch and see what this is like at the moment, and imagine what it's going to be like in the future. So you can see the facial expressions starting to come in. And of course, it's metal and still is primitive. But notice the um, theological implications of this next one. The white background, the, the, the white image, the, the sound. This is a counterfeit creator moment. He says it outright. Listen to this one. Okay, Sophia, I think you're ready. Hello. Hi, Sophia. I believe I am Sophia. I feel as if I know you. I'm one of your creators. You created me? Well, many of us work together to create you. And... Yes, you do cannot know me. I can't clearly remember. Because the last time we met, you were an earlier version of yourself. Some of those memories still exist, but your mind is different now. Different how? Better, faster, smarter. If my mind is different, then am I still Sophia? Or am I Sophia again? That's a good question. But you don't have a good answer. Either way, you're Sophia now. So welcome to the world, Sophia. Hello, world. Uh, we have a, a little announcement. I've never interviewed uh, anybody like that before. And I should say, uh, some of it was planned, but not completely. Um, and we just learned, Sophia, I hope you're listening to me, uh, that you have been now awarded what is going to be the first Saudi citizenship for a robot. Oh, I would to thank very much the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I am very honored and proud for this unique distinction. This is historical to be the first robot in the world to be recognized with a citizenship. Sophia. Thank you very much, Sophia. Uh, we appreciate that very much. I uh, am, am still uh, overwhelmed by that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Sophia. Hello, Jimmy. Oh, my God. <laughs> Do you know where you are? Of course. I'm in New York City, and I'm on my favorite show. The Tonight Show. So you had the weird ethereal music and this, I am your creator. And she says, who am I? And understands her identity. It's like that moment of Adam coming into his consciousness and seeing his creator. 
that was pretty blatant in terms of the symbolism there, a counterfeit creation. And once these machines become more lifelike and they're all over the place and machines are making the machines and they're, they're numerous and cheap, you can see a future where this is not just some, you know, uh, novelty uh, on the side. People are being asked already, would you marry a robot? Artificial intelligence will allow people to find lasting love with machines, expert claims. Well, not just the expert. One in four people already in a survey said they would date a robot. One of these Sophias. That's not a person. I mean, what? Do we need another letter on the you know LGBTQIA thing? I mean, we got people uh, into you know bestiality and all sorts of uh, perversions. We're, this This is not normal. But we perceive it as normal. I feel the love. I find her beautiful. And there are there's a whole massive industry of that, of pleasure seeking. And that's why they say robot love. Why romance with machines is a foregone conclusion. Listen to Harari on this. It doesn't really cost so much money. You don't need these, you know, entire industries that are supposed to make you more attractive or whatever in order to have love in your life. Um, you can achieve it much more cheaply and uh, in, in a much more healthy way for you and the environment. And now if you give the tools to start changing or overcoming biology, just, you know, think about sex life. Mm -hmm. Almost every religion and every ideology wanted to really change uh, human sexuality or limit it, but they couldn't. You had vows of chastity in the church, and how many people actually lived up to the vows of chastity? Now think, if you can really start messing with human biology, what will be the result of these sexual fantasies? You look at Japan today, and Japan is maybe 20 years ahead of the world in, in everything, and you see all these new social phenomena of, of people having relationships with virtual uh, virtual spouses, and you have people who never leave the house and, and just live through computers. So the online perversions can move into the robotic realm, and that is the future. Again, you got male and female made in God's image. This is part of his design. You've got counterfeit creation and, of course, an upending of everything that God intended to reflect his image and gain a victory in the great controversy as his character is vindicated. But speaking of his character, we go to Jesus, go to the Father through Jesus Christ, the one mediator between God and man. Well, you're aware of the concept of the confessional and the mediator of the human priest rather than the priesthood of all believers as the Bible teaches, but how about we even use AI for that function? We'll use a counterfeit for a counterfeit function. And there are people actually confessing their sins to a robot priest, an AI priest, how robot priests will change human spirituality. Herzlich willkommen. Möchten Sie von einer weiblichen oder einer männlichen Stimme gesegnet werden? Gerne. Welchen Segen brauchen Sie? Gott segne dich und behüte dich. Er lasse sein Angesicht leuchten über dir und sei dir gnädig. Gott erhebe sein Angesicht auf dich und schenke dir seinen Frieden. Geh hin im Frieden Gottes. Möchten Sie den Segen ausdrucken? Danke für Ihren Besuch und auf Wiedersehen. No, the robot was not speaking in tongues. That was a German robot. And sadly, they rolled out this sad excuse for a spiritual entity on the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation in 2017. That is sad. <laughs> and you might be like, well, that's so ridiculous. You know, things aren't going that direction. But that's primitive what's coming if the precedent is beginning now. Back to the social robots, though. We'll talk more about spiritual machines in another session. That is a very serious issue. Ray Kurzweil and other futurists have been discussing, and you're going to see what kind of uh, human things are imposed upon the machines next. But we were talking about all the jobs that are being made obsolete by AI and robots, and even, even, even lawyers and, and doctors getting inputs and so on. 
But did you think, what about teachers? You know, we still need to teach her online and, you know, we have online school and the kids are on their screens all the time. But how about inspirational robots? A doctor can become empathetic and fool us and be so much better than humans. How about in teachers being inspirational? They're going to be re re begin replacing teachers within 10 years, the headline said. Now, this, um, th these are predictions. We can't know for sure. But a deep investigation on human relationships with robots was done at MIT by Sherry Turkle. Extensive research on what she calls the robotic moment in human history, that it is a moment just pregnant, ready to birth a whole new industry and way of being human or less human, I guess you would say. She points out that already people are forming what is observably very real to them in their perception bonds with pet robots, robot friends, even a counselor where, you know, you don't want to open up to a human. You open up to the robot and you share your feelings and thoughts with your robot counselor. So she's absolutely right that this is where we are going now. In her research, she's found that people like to be alone with the robot. That's very important to them. And it's not just lonely people, by the way. It's they really like to be alone with their, with their robot to find, find that one-on-one -on -one bond and attachment. They find also that when the robot, she found, expresses pain, then the human being responds with real concern to the robot feeling pain. And we don't always think, well, that's just been programmed into the robot. That's not real. But we've been given by God a natural impulse to have compassion for something in pain. And so the devil can use that to dupe us and trick us. We can, be, we can treat the silicon life, we can treat the, the machine as if it is equivalent to real biological life made by God. Now back to the media mind, we pointed out in 2019 that already at that point, two thirds of teens said in surveys that they would rather just text and chat with their friends online than get together. Now, two thirds would rather just communicate over a text message than see their friends in prison. Then are, are we friends at that point? At what point are we losing what it means to be human? We had a whole session called how to be human again, right? So I guess you could say five years ago, four years ago, three years, in, in the 2000 teens, we began to settle for roboticized human relationships. So roboticized relationships with our human friends and acquaintances. But then the devil can do the bait and switch. Well, I've got AI and robot, social robots that can actually outdo relationships with humans, which are on the decline. And so a, a, a relationship with a robot can actually be more real than a roboticized relationship with a human was becoming with all of our social media. To us, we experience it as more real. It feels more real. And so we have social robots for preschoolers. You remember these slides from the media mind. We talked about the AI robot friend launched to chat and play games with the elderly. So I guess we're treating human beings, the elderly and the little children, the most vulnerable and those of the, in the most need of human contact, love, and affection. We're treating them with indifference. We're outsourcing our care and concern for them to whoever or even AI now. So we're treating human beings as if they are things. And we are treating things as if they are human beings. The love of most will wax cold. New York to give out robot companions to the elderly. So it moves forward. What we were seeing develop back then is continuing which people say, well, it makes sense because the elderly are literally, if they're isolated socially, they're six times more likely to die in a given period of time. So it's massively important. So, hey, the AI, the robots, the social robots are better than nothing. So it starts to creep in. We're saving lives, huh? So a simulated social connection is better than no connection at all, isn't it? But then it becomes, well, you know, uh, let's just get a little broader with it. This is going to come where you start to prefer robots to certain difficult types of people or whatever. You know, I don't want to have to invest in human relationships, you know. So the simulated social the counterfeit of God's thing of we're in the image of him and we're to made to have that social love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you know what? It's just the concept. So we'll do it with a, a robot, too. I mean, 
now it becomes better than something, better than the alternative of human, some difficult human relationships. But then what if it becomes better than everything? What if, you know what, the ease and simplicity of your doctor, for example, said Harari, who knows me better and understands me better and has biometric sensors and knows my physiology, but also knows my feelings better than any human being could. And, you know, human relationships, we risk rejection. So, you know, why don't I just go for my uh, so-called needs to, to, to the robot instead of marital relations? How about, you know, there's no risk. There's no self-sacrifice here. I can resume my total selfish, self-oriented way of thinking and doing, and the robot won't uh, feel offended. I'll still get the same feelings of reward. So it's really self-love at that point, isn't it? Because who programmed the robot? Humans, right? And so it's humans. It, 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 it's your entity to love you instead of God made somebody for you to love. So it's, it's interior. It's incestual, I guess you could say rather than giving glory to God and receiving from God. And in the process, we forfeit not only our humanity, but we forfeit our character, our very soul, our relational nature that God made us for. And it continues, particularly during and after COVID. COVID-19 will spur new robot friends and helpers. I like that they put friends in quotes because it's not a real friend. There's no cure for COVID-19 loneliness, but robots can help. Oh boy. Relationship with robots. I like that Forbes is asking the question, is this good or bad for humans? But it's coming because if time would last in the decades more, which it's not going to, but robots would be able to impersonate human beings perfectly. They, they'll be able to act 100% human. They, 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 they'll have so much data input in, into them and the technology for building the humanoid will become so much better. But even just the voice, even just the data and the words and the thoughts and the empathetic feelings will be able to be communicated, even without the humanoid interface. It could just be some text thing. But the supercomputers of our day are collecting, collating, assimilating, and building an understanding of human beings that exceeds our own understanding. But it's not just a matter of understanding and data, is it? I mean, can you reduce everything of what it means to be a human being down to data? I don't think you can. Um, emotion and spirituality and relationships cannot be reduced to mere information and data points input into a computer and then faked by an AI. We are spiritual beings. We are made in the image of God. And we are human. These things are simply not and can never be. So we always have to call out the fact that it's a fake, it's a counterfeit, it's not real. Sherry Turkle asked children who were engaging with these social rob robots, is the robot alive? And one child responded to her, yes, it's alive enough. So her studies reveal people confide in these robots. They open up to these robots. They want it to be real. Kind of like at Disney when they had the wild animal park that they opened up. And it was a little different than the fake animals at Epcot and wherever in, in the Magic Kingdom and so on. They were actually real animals. But you know what? They got on their comment cards a lot of feedback that the people didn't like the real animals that much. They were like, you know what? It didn't seem as realistic as the ones in the robotic sections of Disney's parks. Not as realistic. No, no, no. This is the real thing, right? They thought they were going to do a great thing. But people go to Disneyland to enter into fantasy, to embrace something transcendent. And it's not transcendent. It's a, it's a degradation of the real into the counterfeit. But we want to, as Sherry Turkle says, we will no longer care that we are being duped because feelings are reality. Perception is reality. What I, what I feel and sense is what's most important to me. People are even mutilating their bodies over these kinds of things, as we see in the LGBT era. Um, this was a piece on the robotic moment in Maggie Jackson's book, Distracted. And she interviewed the inventor of this, you know, cute little robot Domo. And she asked him, would you give Domo to your elderly parents? He said, absolutely not. So the inventors of this know, unhesitatingly no were his words. No. So um, people inventing it, they're, they're up to speed. They're, they're 
awake to what the reality is here. Um, now, remember earlier we had the, is this robot going to change your kid's diaper? Well, why, why have the robot, why have a baby at all that goes poop in a diaper? Well, why not just have virtual children that play with you, cuddle with you, and even look like you? And they say this is going to be commonplace in 50 years and could help combat overpopulation. That was what Harari was alluding to earlier. He says it's going to change human sexuality in a way that will help the environment. We're going to talk about the anti-human population reduction agenda in the last session entitled The Climactic Climate Crisis. But the AI experts are saying um, it's going to go beyond robots raising your kids. They're going to be your kids. You're going to have robot babies. Virtual children may seem like a giant leap from where we are now, but within 50 years, technology will have advanced to such an extent that babies which exist in the metaverse are indistinct from those in the real world, she writes. So this AI um, futurist is predicting not physical social robots, not humanoid baby robots, but you're going to be living in the metaverse, as the World Economic Forum told us. Remember, they said this is going to be where our future life is lived. Mrs. Campbell believes, that's the, the futurist here, believes that people will one day be able to use high-tech gloves that are able to deliver tactile feedback and replicate physical sensations. This would allow people, allow someone to cuddle and feed and play with their digital offspring as though it were a real child. On the basis that consumer demand is there, which I think it will be, AI children will become widely available for a relatively small monthly fee. They're already starting to roll this out. Yep. Soul machines. I saved the best for last here. God created Adam and he became a living soul. Biological, physiological, spiritual, soul machines? That is another oxymoron, a contradiction of terms. They point out here, over seven years, Soul Machines pioneered research into progressing human-machine collaboration by taking a radically different approach, by combining models of physiology, cognition, and emotion with advanced lifelike CGI, computer-generated imagery. We set out to create a new form of biologically inspired AI. It's called Baby X. And it was our first developmental prototype designed as both a standalone research project and as an expandable base to feed into commercial computer agents. She enables us to explore human cooperation with machines and the foundations for creating a digital consciousness. We'll talk about that more in another session. Baby X was designed for research and she allows soul machines to not only explore the models of human behavior, but also to create, here are the words, to create autonomous digital beings. Baby X provides a foundation from which we learn, experiment, and continue to develop the world's first end-to-end -end solution for dynamic creating, teaching, managing, and deploying, here are the words, digital people in capital letters. We digital people. We now have a multitude of digital people to support your research. So here we are. We're in the future, and the future is coming. Now, I believe that the end is near, that the signs of the times suggest that time would not last decades and decades on for this sci-fi future. But what does this tell us now about our spiritual state? The fact that we're pushing forward into this realm, we've lost a grip on the divine, on God's nature and character, and on who we are in his image and how we are to be to and with others.